The sermon text for this morning comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 10 through 16. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this to God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Dr. Rob Bell from Ball State University talks about a psychological term called flow. It is a state where one's movements are efforts, effortless and time is transcended. It is often used in sports analogies and it is known by the phrase being in the zone. Dr. Bell notes that throughout history of sports, there have been numerous examples of athletes being in the zone. A perfect illustration of this state was Michael Jordan during the 1992 NBA Championship Series against the Portland Trailblazers, hitting seven three-pointers in a row and scoring 35 points by the half. Jordan was so shocked by his performance that after his seventh three-pointer, he just threw up his hands as if to say, I can't explain it. Now the beauty of flow or being in the zone is that it's not limited to athletic endeavors. We can encounter flow during our everyday life. To work toward a flow state, we must merge our actions and our awareness. The universal experience for the zone is that our performance becomes automatic. Everything is so effortless that we do not even recognize our total concentration on the task at hand. Now, Dr. Bell ends his article by listing three ways that help us to achieve flow or that feeling of being in the zone. The three ways are to eliminate outside distractions, it is easier to focus on the task without other things getting in the way. To have clear goals that balance our skill level with the challenge. And to approach every task and or activity as an opportunity to improve. Now the natural question for us today is that can we be in the zone? Can we experience that state of flow, that automaticness that makes us thrive? Can we all do that in our relationship with God? Our scripture readings for today seem to be on point. Now, there are, uh, there is, you know, it just occurred to me, um, I'm doing this sermon on scripture readings, and I, and at 8.30, we don't read two scriptures. We only read one. So, let me read Psalm 96, 9 through 16. And then we'll all be on the same page. Let me see, let me get through here. Okay. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. 
Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes with my lips. I declare all ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your prefix. I will fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. The psalmist and St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians show us how to achieve that flow in our lives and on our faith journeys. So let's look at that, looking at the three examples that Dr. Bell gives us in this article. The first thing he says is to maximize being in the zone is to eliminate outside distractions. Now, what are outside distractions that could take us away from God? Well, things in the secular world, opportunities to break the Ten Commandments, people whose behavior take them from God's ways. When we don't have enough time to read scripture and pray daily and we simply push it out of our day. Apathy, hard hats, hard, hard hearts and unrepentant actions. Some scholars believe that there is only one sin in the world, and that is the sin of idolatry. Which means if God is not the fixed center part of your life, then something else has taken God's place. And when something else is more important than God, that's when sin enters in and takes over our lives. To be in the zone is to set our mind, is to focus on God, which means God needs to come first. When God comes first, all other things, including our sinful behavior, they all get pushed to the side. When God comes first, our lives come into focus. Our intentions are clear. Our thoughts are pure. When God comes first, our hearts are full. The psalmist tells us how to keep our focus. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart, I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. The psalmist knew that for us to focus on our faith, our focus needs to be on God. And God has given us the tools to stay on the right path. We guard our way. We stay on that path by listening to God's word, by seeking God with our whole hearts, by not straying from the Ten Commandments and to treasure God's word. It involves some work, some effort on our part, but we can keep our distractions at bay. And the best way to do that is to let God be the distraction from those things that keep us from God's word. Now, the second piece of advice here is to have clear goals that balance our skill level with our challenges. Now, I just have two things to say about when we set goals in our life with Christ. I've been saying this to you for over a year since I have been here at this church. I've said many times, you make this church that much better because you are here. We need to believe that statement to be true, and then we need to get to work. We need to use our gifts to serve God. We need to use our gifts to become the people that God knows us to be. We also need to know that our goals don't have to be some grandiose, change the world type of action. Don't think, now they can be, but don't think that when we set goals to do God's work, that that's exactly what God is looking for. God's not expecting us to cure cancer. God's not expecting us to save the world from an enemy invasion. God's not expecting us to invent the next Heinz ketchup or to know who wrote the book of love. God wants us to do what is natural based on who we are as children of God. The psalmist pronounced it, with my lips I declare all the ordinances of my mouth. I delight in the ways of your decrees. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. 
I will delight in your statutes and I will not forget your word. Here in scripture we see that the psalmist is relying on God's law to keep grounded and, that, and trusting that by following God's way their life will be fulfilled. When we have clear goals and we trust God, we simply do our best and we put the rest into God's hands. Now the third thing to achieve flow is we are supposed to approach every task and or activity as an opportunity to improve. Paul talks about this in his letter to the Philippians. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ has made me his own. I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do do, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God is in Christ Jesus. So here's what Paul is saying. As Christians, our work is never done. We must always be striving to do what comes next. There are constantly people to help, friends to forgive, and loved ones to inspire. We are forever to love our neighbor, befriend the friendless, and demonstrate God's grace. We are to never stop seeking, never cease praying, never terminate the reading of God's word. Paul says that he presses on towards the goal. He does not say, I reach the goal and stop. I finish the race and run no more. I have accomplished much, but it's time for the next person to give it a go. I'm done. With God, we are never done. We can, with our lives, find opportunities each day to live in, to bring about, to be affected by, and to show others the glory of God. We don't rest. We don't find our stopping point. We don't give up in our efforts. Because God's work, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's grace, God's love continues in us. It doesn't stop. So we shouldn't stop. Now in his book, A Severe Mercy, author Sheldon Vanacon tells the story of a dog named Gypsy. And when I let Marcy read this story, she said, oh, that was my first dog growing up. So, no reason for that, I digress. <laughs> Gypsy was a dog that lived on a farm with her master. Lots of room on the farm, lots of opportunities for Gypsy to have lots of freedom, to run and play and frolic and do what dogs do in the wide open spaces. She had a roof over her head, she had food in her belly every day. She was asked to help the farmer to do some chores around the farm. And she was asked to be obedient, to come when he called and to do what he said. And then she could have all the freedom that she wanted and needed. And this worked well. When she was out in the confines of the farm somewhere, all the farmer had to do was call her name and she would come running. And she would do what she had, excuse me, what she would have to do. One day, she hears his voice puts her head up, and comes running from somewhere on the farm because the master called her. But as she goes running, what runs in front of her is a rabbit. And all the dog instincts kick in, and Gypsy takes off after the rabbit. And it takes a long time for the farmer to finally get her home. And he's upset because she doesn't have the obedience he expects, but at the same time, it was a one-off. It was a rabbit, it happens. He let it go. But what he discovered is whenever he called her and something like a squirrel or a rabbit got in her way, got focus of her attention, she would not listen to his voice and she would take off. And it would take him a long time to get her back. So she lost her freedoms. She was now confined to a pen, which means she worked a lot more than she did before because she had to be with the master more often than not. And when she was outside, when she did get in the open air, she was on a leash. And so she learned the hard way that she has less freedoms when she took the freedom to do whatever she wanted. And so this had been going on for a while and she'd been pretty good. And one day the farmer decides he's going to go out to the woods beyond the farm and he's going to reward Gypsy and give her 
some freedom out in the woods. And so he takes her and he takes another dog, Flurry, who was Gypsy's daughter, puppy, whatever you, you know my pet peeve, I don't like it when parents call them, when owners of dog call themselves mommy and daddy, so I won't say that. But he takes them out into the woods and they are roaming and running and together and they're having a great time and he calls them to get back in the car and here comes Flurry and here comes Gypsy and just as Gypsy gets to the car, she sees a rabbit and she takes off. And he calls her back with that emergency in his voice, with that urgency in the tone of his voice. Because they're not in the confines of the farm anymore. And Gypsy is just gone. And he calls for her and calls for her and she doesn't come. And he spends until it's pitch black looking for her in the woods. And she doesn't come. And he comes back the next day. And he continues her search but she never comes back. So he goes home and now he has Flurry as his main dog and she is very obedient and she comes when she calls and she likes the attention she gets from being a good girl and she likes the freedom that she gets from doing the duties on the farm and having that ability to run within the confines of the farm property. But Gypsy never does come back. She spends the rest of her days out in the wild. She doesn't have the freedom of a warm place to stay every night. She doesn't have the freedom of food in her tummy every night. She is forever scrounging. She is forever lurking and running around. She becomes matted with her hair and just that kind of grungy dog look to her. And she's forever running from people who are afraid of her, who are pushing her away, chasing her with sticks so that they don't come near her. And that is how she spends the rest of her days. Don't mean for that to be sad. But it's true because we do that, don't we? We, we run away from God at times. And we are dull to the sound of his voice. And we have the freedom of the big world. And it's so easy not to hear and not to come and not to obey and to do whatever we want. And the irony here is that we lose our freedom when we do that. Because when God comes, number first, when God is that fixed focus in our lives, when we can do that, then we find out that we are never alone and God is never far from us. And when we can focus on that and do that every day and that focus becomes routine, we can be in that zone. We can make goals. We can have a focus. We can always be striving to improve. And we can do that so much with God's help every day that how we serve and how we spend time with him becomes so automatic that we get to be in the zone. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. Help us to work hard to obey your word, to do your word, to live out your word each and every day so that we may be in your company and do your work now and always. Amen.